Actors, we've all got issues, so let's talk about them. I'm Juan Yala, and welcome to Actors with Issues. Each week, we bring you interviews with actors from across TV, film, and Broadway, taking many deep dives into their careers and getting into the successes, the struggles, and of course, the issues that they face as actors. That's enough about us. Let's dive into the episode. In celebration of Pride Month, we are joined by a delightful group of entertainers for a special roundtable discussion. Joining us from Disney Channel's upcoming Zombies 3, it's Terry Hugh. Fierce LGBTQ plus advocate and recording artist Lake, actor, writer, and director Max Talisman, Broadway television and TikTok star Ian Paget, and joining us once again from Netflix is Dash and Lily and Apple TV plus series We Crashed, Troy Iwata. Alrighty, so uh, everyone, before we dive in uh, to our conversation, we always start with a rapid fire round of questions. Ooh. So I'm gonna just throw some questions your guys' way Ooh. and hope for the best. It's a group this okay. time, so. <laughs> So, Terry, okay. coffee or tea? Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Say that again. <laughs> coffee or tea? Tea. Max, film or television? Oh, fuck. Sorry, um. <laughs> You're allowed to swear. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, watched more film these days, actually. I'll say film right now. Yeah. Troy, screen acting or stage acting? Uh, uh uh stage acting ian hero or villain villain <laughs> like what artist has had the biggest influence on you freddie mercury good oh, choice okay. i was like that's the hardest question yeah that is a really hard <laughs> rapid fire one <laughs> that's a really good answer though I, yeah. I'll yeah. Down. yeah an honest one <laughs> uh terry what is the last show that you binge watched money heist Max, what was your first non-acting job? I've never had one. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky oh, you. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Lex. Um, <laughs> I, know, I, I, I think that's just luck. I, I got hired at a Regal once, but I, I never called them back. <laughs> <laughs> they like recruited you. They like saw you and they're like, no, you I, should like, work I, for like, Regal. It was, it was an AMC actually. It was the one in Lincoln Square back when I lived in New York. And um. I got the job and I just like didn't call back. No, I applied for it. I just never called back. Yeah. I yeah. love it. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, Troy, what movie has never failed to make you laugh? Um, kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Ian, what movie has never <laughs> failed to make you cry? <gasps> oh, wow. It's rapid fire. Um... <laughs> Oh my God, what movie has never failed to make me cry? Oh my God, there were so many. Um, I'm gonna go with, oh God. Oh my God, this is so hard. Um, and I don't wanna say like a cheesy one because I have that one. You know, there's like that one that you watch, but of course when you're in the hot seat, you're like, God damn it, I don't know the answer. Um, <sighs> E.T. That's a good That's choice though. That's not what I thought you were gonna say. Okay. <laughs> You know, that's not what I thought I was going to say, but we don't have all the time in the world, so that's going to be my answer right now. <laughs> my answer is always Coco. Never fails to make me weep. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, wow. Lake, what is your dream collaboration? Oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. Um, this is really hard. I'm going to go with Janet Jackson, just because she's been such a huge influence my whole life. Good choice. Yes. Work, work. And uh, lastly, and everyone gets to take a second to think, um, but describe your most memorable audition in three words. And memorable can be good or bad. So I leave that up to you. Mine happens to be a bad one, but we won't talk about it. <laughs> Am I first? Okay. Whoever, whoever's ready. Okay. Um, my, one, it's one of my worst. Falling, crying, and laughing. <laughs> It's always good to laugh. <laughs> the what? It's always good to laugh, you know. Oh, yes, always good to laugh, yes. But you can tell how emotional that audition was. Going <laughs> 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 by three words. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go with, I'll, I'll talk, this one popped in my head a little earlier, uh, like I auditioned for, they were doing a chorus line and it was always a like, dream to be in that show and play Paul. And no one ever thought of me as like Latin enough or this or that, but like this day people were like, oh, like you're Latin enough, thank God. Um, and I remember I auditioned and like, I had had a kind of crazy travel weekend, the like right before, and I had memorized his monologue. Like they gave you the full monologue and I was like, okay, like I kind of know it. 
And then I like didn't look at it over the weekend because I was just like, I want to be where I'm at and be super present. And then like, I'll handle the procrastination of that decision later. And then I like go to this audition. I for sure think I'm going to get like cut because I'm just assuming like, you're just going to keep a bunch of people you've worked with before, all the stuff you tell yourself. And um, in hopes that maybe you don't have to like actually do this, this, this monologue that maybe you don't remember anymore. And, um, and I remember I got like called back and I went in the room and like surprisingly like knew the monologue and like as though I had always known it, it was like really bizarre. And I had just kind of looked over it right before going in. And it was one of those moments where like, I knew I did a really good job because when, I don't know if you guys know Chorus Line at all, but uh, mm -hmm. there's like a, he, he sings, um, it's like the famous, like, uh, who am I anyway? Am yes. I my rep? And like when that tune, I get goosebumps even like, thinking about it, but like when those chords start to happen, at least in this audition setting, I like started crying, like crying. Mm -hmm. It just was like happening and I couldn't really finish. I mean, like I did, but it was just like this moment. And then I remember the director just being like, wow, and we haven't even gotten to the monologue yet. And I was like, ha ha. <laughs> and you know, there was just something nice about like getting them on your side and me feeling like, okay, we're pushing through. Um, and that was just like a cool moment. And then I ended up doing the role. So that was very fun. That was a cool well, moment. It's good to hear that someone else cried in an audition. That makes me feel a little better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it served really, me. It definitely served. Yeah, that was a really good choice of three words, Ian. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, was that the was that the requirement? Oh my god. <laughs> RIP me. I'm dead. Literally, I I didn't I guess wait, was that the requirement? Do we have to say it was three words? Because yeah. <laughs> I, I just didn't want to like, stop like, you. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be a good one. Oh my god. Right. I was sitting over here listening, and I was like, Lake, I was like, just I was like, that's I wow. I'm so I thought I did well, you got a good story. A yeah, I thought story. I did something wrong for a while. I was like, wait, was I supposed to tell a whole story? I feel really- Oh okay. my God. <laughs> wow. Okay. It's the AirPods. It's the AirPods. Okay. <laughs> Didn't I come love through. For the record. Thank you for sharing that because I loved it. Wow, you guys really, you, thank you for honoring that moment for me. Hard to follow up, I feel like, because that one- <laughs> That, that's such a good experience. Did I just interrupt someone who I can't see this? Oh, no, 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 I just really? said it's okay. a fun room. Oh, okay, okay, good, good. Um, it's the AirPods, yeah. Um, but um, I, um, it's the AirPods. Uh, oh, God, that sounds like a good experience, Ian. But for me, it was like humiliating, ostracizing. It's like, what other words? It was just, I want to tell the story too, but I'm not, I can't, I can't, I can't. And like, what is the opposite of athletic? like not athletic, do you know what I mean? Like showing to be so not athletic, whatever that word would be. Or maybe klutzy, I don't know what like, the word is for like, that. Just like, yeah, klutzy. I think unathletic like is a word, right? Oh really? I okay, unathletic. unathletic. Yeah. <laughs> non-athletic, non-athletic, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> done, there we go. So that was mine. Mm -hmm. uh, Trey, you go ahead. High school quarterback. Oh. Uh, those are three words, high school quarterback. Yeah. It's wrong, completely wrong <laughs> for it. <laughs> that leaves a lot of great scenarios up to interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Um, mine is um, shopping mall dancing. Oh wow! Oh, wow! I've been there actually. Yeah. <laughs> I know this one. <laughs> You were there. You know, yeah. I like that everyone else's answer allows like the the audience to like come up with a story of like when he says like shopping mall dancing, like I wonder what that is. <sighs> Can I go again? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> also, the opposite of athletic is they give you two options, weak or fra frail. Wow. Oh my God. Frail. You know what? You know what? You know what? That is, is better. <laughs> I'm just gonna go with non-athletic on that yeah, one. Yeah, non-athletic. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very yeah. much. On record, it's non-athletic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah that yeah, really yeah. dragged me. Okay. <laughs> Weak or frail. I was like, oh, good. okay, good. Oh my god, that's so funny. Oh wow. Um, okay. So given that this is um, our Pride Month, or one of our many Pride Month episodes, um, I'd also like to start with the question: uh, What does Pride mean to you? I think Pride Month for me is living authentically, openly, and expressively. Um, being from Texas and growing up in a, a world that 
did not have any queer examples of individuals around me when I moved to California and I started engaging in pride and around California and around the U.S. and stuff, it really opened up a whole new world of like acceptance and love and authenticity to me and really helped me step into like who I am. So really helped me figure out my own self-expression, I think. And uh, Troy. Think- oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wait, your turn. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, that's, I, th- it's kind of similar. Yeah, I feel like pride, it, the beauty of pride is that it's everyone's own interpretation and definition of it and living, living authentically as yourself and realizing that that can just be an array of so many things. I do think that like th- how, how mainstream pride has become like in like, I don't know, you know, corporate America, it's given a lot of people this idea of what, what being queer means. So I think that true pride is, understanding that you can you can definitely still be a part of that but it doesn't have to look that way um Mm -hmm. and it can literally look like anything i think it to me pride just means loving yourself in any way that in whatever unique way that you are i love that answer i love that no you know ian Uh yeah, I was just jumping in like I, I'm thinking back to like my experiences with pride and and the ones that I always remember. It's just there's just like a sense of joy. And I feel like it's it, it I just love that like there's this month that I look forward to or this time or whatever that everyone feels a little bit more joy than they do in their like everyday life. You know what I mean? Like we're all doing work and, da, 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 and there's this thing we look forward to. And you know, like I didn't grow up kind of like celebrating pride as a teenager, like any of that, like that came a little later for me. That's sort of like blooming into um, like my queerness and just like moving to New York and all of a sudden meeting other gay people and like finding spaces where we were all, uh, we were kind of like felt safe, you know? And it was like, oh, there's more of us and we're here and we're having a good time. And so for me, pride is like this moment of just feeling joyful about who you are and it's like my, it's just, it's my favorite, it's my favorite part about it. Cause everyone feels that sense of like, oh my God, hey, hey. It's just like, there's a little bit more um, willingness to just like be open. You know what I mean? Because you don't feel scared. I think like fear goes away during pride a, a little bit, at least for me, like some of my fear goes away and I'm just like, I, I'm open to all of you. And, and, and just receiving that love is, is one of my favorite things about pride. And uh, Max, what do we have? I think for me, it's a lot of joy too. It's, but I also think it's um, kind of recognizing how far the community has come. And also for me, how far we have to go, especially like not only as a community, but like as a country and like, you know, as a world, you know, planet. Um, I think there's a, a lot to celebrate. And like, I think that's the focus of Pride Month, but I also think it's okay to kind of like, you know, take stock of the moment and be like, okay, and um, how do we go on from here, right? Because the fight for me, I mean, and I think for a lot of us, we feel the fight isn't done yet. I mean, um, it's Pride Month and Bill Maher last night on his show said that uh, being queer is in right now. And so people are choosing to be queer or something along those I, lines. For the record, I hate him so much. I'm just going to straight up say that. You know, you have people in um, the, you know, public lots of con saying things like that, regardless of the time. And so I think we um, are always like, you know, striving to further things for uh, our community and for those who need to be fought for. And like, like you, I have a bit of a disdain for, for Bill Maher, um, just because of his company. He said similar, um, or said something somewhat similar about the term um, Latinx. And that he brought on, of course, like a Republican senator who was Hispanic and was like, oh, like this senator says that it's uh, bad to use that word because it's confusing for people. And it's 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 not, you know, in Latin people in his district are not accepting of it. I'm like, well, what if you brought on AOC? What would she say? Or what, would, what mm-hmm. if you brought on like someone who like uses the term regularly? Like it's just it feels so one sided to me, um, his points of view and and. And I think it's getting, I mean, more and more one-sided, but I mean, that's like, yeah. I also think, you know, it was all over like deadline and variety. And I think that's also an issue to give um, something he says such a voice to begin with. If it was said on a show, like, let it be, don't start posting it all over social media. 
Right. Because there are I people mean, who read that, you know? And yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that, that, like, celebrities have, like, I get it, like, you can say what you want and freedom of speech and all that stuff, but at a certain point, you're putting targets on people's backs, you know what I'm saying? You're, you have an audience, and by, by making light of these situations, there's a lot of people not taking these things as jokes, they're not taking it on that level, and they're, mm. they're, they're internalizing that as hate towards marginalized communities, whether it be, you know, comedians using, you know, Dave Chappelle with jokes towards the trans community, they're not jokes, you know, this type of joke, this is all low hanging fruit. It's all, you know, like, like, uh, POC jokes about people of color, stuff like this, all this type of stuff, you know, jokes about people's bodies. So this is all like low hanging fruit. Like comedians need to get off this tip. They need to figure out actually how to be funny without having to use isms to get reactions. And the thing is, is that you are inciting certain things and putting targets on people's backs by doing these things. So they do have a somewhat of a responsibility and they need to start taking actual accountability for it. Yeah, yeah I think specifically with someone like Dave Chappelle, I was at Comedy Cellar and he just like walked in and did a surprise set. And, and he not only attacked the trans community, but he also attacked the LGBTQ community at large, you know, gay people, bi people, whatever. And um, I was with my two straight friends and an audience of people who were laughing and it was, really jarring and really scary because yeah. i mean these it, for them it's like you know you need to learn how to take a joke but there's a difference between a joke and being hateful and i think yeah. a lot yeah. of people are forgetting that and i don't think it's right obviously for people to attack dave Chappelle on stage but i think it's also not right for him to be um making those jokes and then you know to be attacked on stage and say it was probably a trans person when it wasn't um but and he he's even once further like right like exactly. yeah. go even further in his being terrible you know yeah yeah i i mean yeah i think there's a lot i just think there's a lot of layers to that and you know we just have to remember that um if we're comedians if we're actors we um need to kind of stay above the fray not not join it or even be worse than it right that is so well put that is yeah. so good yes and uh, before we move, uh, before we move on, uh, Terry, what does uh, pride mean to you? Yeah, no, um, that was all really well said. Um, I agree, agree with everyone. Uh, I think kind of going off of what Troy was saying earlier, like Pride Month is a really dedicated time, and like I love it because it is this dedicated time for extra visibility, that sort of thing. But yeah, it's a very, it can, and Pride Month is like very you know visible but it is a very i think like internal process too mostly because it's, it's it's not just one month right um and it's just like it's kind of like all around and i think that relationship exists no matter what and so for me it's kind of like pride month is really really special because it is this time to kind of you know honor those who came before us show queer joy which to me is just like beautiful to see always and um you know to be around and is like so defiant for me and i think there's like there's that beauty and that defiance um because of everything that's going on you know and this and that should that defiance goes on all the time but now we kind of see it um and more and i just think with everything that's going on the extra visibility or like any opportunity for visibility is super important you know but yeah. um also yeah to tie it up like i think for me when i think being proud it it is like i've it's taken a long time but now i feel pretty proud like just period of you know my identity but it took a while um but I think it's like, yeah, I love being queer. We don't have to get into that. I love being queer just because I do, but also it's more just like, I love that like I have done the work and it is work to like pursue authenticity. Cause I really do think that authenticity is like as hard as it is to achieve it sometimes. It's like the only way you can fulfill, like really live a fulfilling life. And so I think it's like, whatever that looks like for people it's a different pace and path, you know, but um, so yeah, I think Pride is Pride Month is really awesome, but Pride is just something that's like ever present, you know, or like that relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. Similar with Pride Month, you know, like obviously, like I, as you just said, we feel pride year round. Um, similarly with Hispanic Heritage Month, for all Hispanics, we're like, well, every month is Hispanic Heritage Month because I don't yeah. do anything extra <laughs> Hispanic yeah. from September fifteenth to October fifteenth. It's <laughs> it's me year round. Uh, so, yeah. so yeah, I'm sure it feels the same for everyone. When it comes to like those sort of cultural months that they have set up it's like well that's my reality year round so yeah you know, and I think it's important to say you? yeah I'm sorry to interrupt um I was just gonna say like it's important to also comment and like I don't think it's us just being like 
always asking for more, but it's because I think people use sometimes the month to tokenize it, like to, you know, just do whatever. And so we have to just like, I think make it a point also that it's like, it's not mm. justice, but of course we would, we appreciate any opportunity for extra visibility. Like we're not just on, you know, like, um, but it is distinctly because of all the people I think trying to make it just a fad or in or whatever. Right. And it's just simply not. <laughs> so, yeah. And I'm also curious. So uh, uh, something that, that I like to ask on the show as well is in terms of representation, um, when is the first time that you saw a performance uh, or an actor or anyone that made you feel seen and represented for the first time? I, I was thinking about this and I don't know if anyone else had the same experience growing up, but like I grew up really kind of idolizing and, and being attracted to these, to women's performances. And I obviously now I'm like obsessed with Will and Grace or Nathan Lane in, in, um, Birdcage, like there are people, but like, if I'm really, really going by like what lit me up, what I found so like amazing and fantastical that I was like, I want to be them was Barbara and Hello Dolly was you know, like Rosalind Russell at, in Gypsy, like Natalie Wood in, G you know what I mean? Like these like iconic performances and just like, like I never looked at the boys in West Side. I was like, I want to be one of the boys in West Side because I never felt, I was like, I just, that's just not where I was at the time. And I, that was my own like journey with feeling comfortable with who I was and going, oh, I can be that. That can be me, even though I feel like, I just like what she's, I like, I'm obsessed with Rita Moreno in that movie because she's iconic and it's just like, everyone should always be talking about that. But like those people, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. It's like, and, and, and I might be the, I might be the outlier, but like, obviously like, you know, Sean Hayes and Will and Grace, um, Mario Cantone and Sex in the City, who was just coming in and giving me like opinion, 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 and who is now one of my dear friends, which is hilarious. But like growing up, I remember just being like, I love who this person is because one, he's funny. And two, it's, it just, I love anyone who's coming in with like, I know myself and I'm talking to you like I know myself. And that was really fun to see that wasn't in multicam world or just like sitcom. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it started off with like the fierce women of the movies. Yeah. Did you I ever watch, the, um, oh, sorry. You know, I was going to say really quick, uh, I feel that that's definitely the case for a lot of people is like sort of those just fierce, um, out loud, large in life, unabashedly themselves characters. It's like, cause especially as like, for me, at least being a Latino growing up in a religious household. I couldn't watch Will and Grace because I'd probably get in trouble. I had to stop watching Glee at one point because my parents were like, what is this gay kid on the show? And I'm like, okay, well, I guess we'll just DVR this and watch it later. Or, you know, like I, I could never watch it like when, uh, whenever the family was home, unfortunately. And like, it was always those characters who were like, again, like just un un unabashedly themselves that are the ones that we're always sort of like drawn toward because it's like, well, I wish I could be that. I wish I could just be mm -hmm. myself. And especially having that sort of like repressed uh all those repressed emotions and all of that i feel like that's definitely a reason why yeah yeah trey what were you gonna say oh i was just gonna piggyback on that like growing up as like a gay kid the the characters that i modeled myself after were like helga pataki um <laughs> like uh raven simone lizzie mcguire mm -hmm. and like I watched Totally Spies on Cartoon Network, if any of you watched that. These were all yeah. just like these badass, beautiful women who were just like um, were unapologetically themselves. And honestly, like I didn't, I, I saw gay representation, but I think like back then it was, media was at a time where we're kind of still in this time where it was like, it was just letting people know that gay people existed no matter what. So I think that's why they were portrayed in a really stereotypical way. And it was just like, they, yeah, sure they exist. And they come in every once in a while and like, that's it. And so like, I thought about this question. I was like, I don't know. I feel like the first time I ever saw like a gay, char a gay character that I really loved was Noah Galvin's performance in The Real O'Neills. Have you ever watched that show? Mm -mm. <laughs> He's like, he's, a gay, he's like this gay kid in high school. It was hilarious. And it was so nuanced and real. And he was so gay, but at the same time, it wasn't a stereotype. Like he was just this like, this like choir kid who was obsessed with herbal tea. And it was like, it was fantastic. Oh my God. I love that. It's funny. It, like, just to hear you say that, I was really trying to rack my brain. I was like, what did I grow up with watching that wasn't like, 
and I, I just didn't have it. Like it just, yeah. uh, you know, I was like watching French Prince of, French Prince of Bel-Air, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, or like <sighs> even Stevens, like back in the day, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and so I like, I just don't, I, I feel like if someone showed me, Ian, here are all the memories of everything you ever watched, I'd be like, oh, okay, there he was, but it didn't stand out because like you're saying, I was more drawn to something other than me. Mm-hmm. And the other, like the other, like even if they were there, like I just, for some reason, they just didn't like, it, it didn't feel maybe that like they were connecting with me at that time. I don't know. It's like, oh, it's, it's weird, but. Maybe too, because they were being portrayed in a, in a sort of br- brush them off kind of way. And it was just like, maybe a little bit of them. And it's like, that wasn't enough for me to be like, that's me. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like this, like this obnoxious stereotype that would come in and then leave. And you're like, hey. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Max, what comes to mind is the first time you felt represented? Never. No, I mean, I think like, um, as a, you know, gay person who's, uh, you know, large, like body type wise, I actually, I mean, other than Cam on Modern Family, but that is like such a caricature, seriously. I mean, like, I, I have a lot of respect for that show for, you know, putting the first like prominent gay couple on for pretty much series regulars, but also it's a caricature. And um, I think we can all recognize that now. Um, that doesn't mean it didn't break barriers then. It just means, you know, now I don't see it in the same way. Um, but yeah, no, I think, you know, for me, I, I haven't really seen that. I mean, Nathan Lane in the birdcage is probably the closest. Um, but I think, you know, it's a, uh, it's an ongoing journey. And I think that's why I, I turned to writing and directing my own parts and for myself. It's because I didn't see myself on screen. And I know there are bigger kids out there who are part of the community and who, you know, deserve to be seen too. And so I, I that's one of the reasons why I turned to writing and directing um, for my own roles. It was, it was because it didn't exist. It's interesting. I, I didn't really feel represented until, um, sadly, until two years ago when the first season of Love, Victor came out. I'm like, mm-hmm. here's this brown Hispanic kid raised in a religious family. I'm like, this is my life I'm seeing on screen. Mm-hmm. And I'm so you're, sad. You're li- you are giving Love, Victor, for sure. Like, that's what you're <laughs> giving, totally. So, like, that makes total, total sense. Mm-hmm. I did. I mean, in some ways, I, speaking on that, I felt somewhat represented by Love, Simon. But, like, also because of, like, oh, weird coincidences. Yeah. Like, my best friend in high school was named Leah, which is was... And also I was doing cabaret my senior year. There was like weird things where I, and my middle <laughs> name is Simon. So I felt like they stole from my life a little bit. But it's, <laughs> it's like accidental representation. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. It's like, well, I, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lake, what was uh, one of the first times you felt represented? I mean, I can't, I grew up in a really conservative environment in Texas. So there wasn't a lot of exposure to seeing characters because I think it was kind of mitigated the the big queer movies and the big queer moments. I, I wasn't growing up being shown until I got it was getting into dance and stuff. And some of my dance teachers started showing musicals and different things. And I started like feeling something I'm like there's something going on here. Like I can relate to some of the energy of these characters. For me, a lot of it came from androgynous musicians. Like, because for me, I'm very much, you know, I'm non-binary femme, but I'm very androgynous and I, a bit more of a bit of butch queen, I call myself. Um, so I feel like seeing, like I said earlier, Freddie Mercury and, and, and how he, his, his, his masculine feminine energies and also Prince in the same way, Grace Jones was really important to me because of, uh, as, as a queer ally icon, as a queer icon, uh, just everything that she was doing, you know, was just so, different than other women I'd seen. And I was grew up in an environment that was very much, you're a girl and you know, you'll do ballet and you'll have pink on your walls and you will wear dresses. And I never really had um, an opportunity to exper- like, experiment with who I was, you know, as a younger kid in any way and, you know, dress, you know, maybe go to school dressed more masculine looking or whatever. I didn't have that opportunity. I went to private school. I was always wearing like, a little skirt and the whole nine yards, you know? So it was, very much put into you're a girl and this is what you do. And and the way that my family was, it was kind of like girls don't play sports, girls do this, you know, they do feminine things. And I understand they came from different backgrounds, but it was kind of hard for me to find representation. So when I did see musicians that were androgynous, that were running across stages, that were 
gender bending, you know, fashion norms and societal norms of what a woman or a man should be doing, you know, on a stage in front of an audience in front of other people and how they should look. That really helped me see that, you know, there's, it's okay to be, to, 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 um, uh, you know, experiment with the sides of your different sides of yourself, the masculine and feminine sides of yourself. And that, that helped me see, you know, I have other things going on. And I think that's kind of helped me discover, you know, you're queer, like there's something else going on here, but there were also crushes on different actors. <laughs> definitely told me not necessarily as much representation, but definitely told me, okay, you're in the right, you're, you're not, you're onto something here. Like, you know, they say, I, I, I had a big crush on Natasha Leone growing up. I had a huge crush on Parker Posey, a big crush on Shannon Sossaman. There were certain girls that I was like, I don't want to be you. I want to date you. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, so different representations coming from different areas that helped me figure out, become more comfortable with figuring out that I was queer. So it wasn't exact representation, but it was people that helped me along the way, you know? Mm. Awesome. Jumping in on that and also how Love, Simon stole my life. Um, my gay awakening <laughs> was Daniel Radcliffe and his was in the movie too. So they stole my life. <laughs> Just putting it out there. <laughs> so. And Terry, what about you? Um, honestly, when I think about represent, like growing up representation, I think I was thinking more about Asian representation. Um, I mean, I knew I was queer like from the womb, but it was obviously like being Asian is and queer and stuff is like such a an inextricable part of me that that was kind of what I was looking for, I think. And I also just didn't really see, yeah, like much queer representation. I mean, I I probably I think that for me it was just like such an impossibility to even think about seeing an Asian character on screen that I kind of like, and then to be Asian and queer, and that's a whole other thing, like that intersection and how they're, you know, I think that stereotype goes around that and stuff. So um, the first time I did, did feel like I was represented um, in terms of being Asian was Lost. Um, Sun, she was a series reg, I believe, in that ensemble cast, and it was really cool. And she was like from Korea, I'm Chinese, but she was from Korea and stuff, so she wasn't like, you know, she, she wasn't like American born, which is fine, but I think just even seeing on screen someone that, is Asian and like that can be part of the ensemble cast with all this that was like really big but in terms of queerness and being non-binary I yeah honestly I don't really feel like I I saw a lot of that and it's something that I think you know they're like we've come a long way for sure but kind of like what Max said earlier there is a lot more to go and like um it's not a time to get complacent and stuff like that but um yeah I love what uh, Ian and Troy were talking about in terms of like they really were inspired by or like the female role models and for me maybe it was like when I saw that I was like I love it but I'm almost like I it, that feminist scared me maybe and not that they were all I'm sure too femme but like for me I struggled because I probably my whole life was like I don't really know that I am a girl and I came out as non-binary a few years ago when I like finally really thought it through I think but and like felt brave enough but um yeah for me I while I admired that and stuff like that, it was just like the feminist almost scared me a little bit, you know, because I was like, I can't be that. Like, I don't know how to be that then, right? But then I also didn't know that I could be a man, like, you know what I mean? So it was like, it's very this liminal space that is very confusing. And I think, um, yeah, so it's like exciting to kind of just hopefully get more stories that are like well rounded and kind of full fledged, you know, um, as characters and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I, I really feel like you were kind of on the opposite because I was being fed so much feminine stuff and I yeah. felt the masculine energy and I was like scared to go there. You know what I'm saying? Interesting. You know what I mean? Like I, I felt yeah. really cool. And I was like, which is probably why like, you know, girls like Shannon Sossaman with like the shorter hair and then like the perfect yeah, yeah. Asha Leon. It's kind of like, because they have kind of masculine energies in their own ways. Yes. You know what I'm saying? They were kind of right. Yes. So I was like in this femme world, I was, but I was, I wanted to go more mask, you know? And I was yeah. you know, mm -hmm how to, it, you know, let myself go there because I was like in this box. So we kind of were on opposite ends. Yeah, just, it is really interesting how it all plays out, yeah. I just was thinking about like, for some of us who grew up and were like, yeah, like we didn't maybe, it was, why is it I couldn't see it? Or why don't I have like a list of three or four people? Mm -hmm. But at that time, we didn't live in this social media time where everything is a lot more, you know, Liz. like, you, where everyone has to be authentic it's a very different time slash at the time mm -hmm. you know the people who were playing gay characters were predominantly straight so yeah. to me it's that they were like 
bad or stereotypical or like they were a caricature. Like, I, I never felt that. I just remembered being like, oh, I think if maybe I knew, it just, we didn't know they were gay because they were just being played by different actors. And like, they were the not central, most interesting character of what was being written. And that's, so you're like, oh, I'm not paying attention to this because what's being delivered to me, you're saying, pay attention over here. This is, this is the through line. And then I think that's, what's been beautiful about like where we are now. And like, yes, there's much, many places much you know further to go but like we've come a very long way you know what I mean like where like we have central gay stories we have all shapes and sizes LGBTQ I mean it's just like it's so a part of the ether and 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 I just love that you know what I mean like I'm mm -hmm. I, I like the the Billy Eichner rom-com which I just think is like very cool that he did and that the straight characters are all played by LGBTQ people I was just like oh like that is that I think is kind of so fun and brilliant I mean I'm excited That's to brilliant. see it and be like okay like what is, what is it giving um but like yeah like I, I think that was just another thing growing up it was like oh they just they weren't hitting you on the head with like this is a gay character you have to pay attention to this gay character you know what I mean and mm -hmm. so you got to just like after the fact go oh wait like we're not being seen and so that's just how that works like art is made that represents what is what we think the world wants and people in high places who think they know what we want and then revolution starts and people go wait there needs to be a little bit more of this story and that's just kind of how that goes you know um i agree with that i think i mean you see that in uh heartstopper which just came out and like became a huge you know, took over social media because people were so excited about feeling seen and represented. And they gave, you know, Netflix gave it two seasons right off the bat because they saw um, that people were, you know, really excited about a series like that. And I wanted to um, to highlight some of your individual work. So Max, you mentioned before that you um, are starting to write, direct your own content and you recently um, did your directorial and writing feature film debut um mm -hmm. so what can you tell us about the project it's called things like this so congrats yeah congrats. so it's actually it is a romantic comedy too um and uh you know i was basically every romantic comedy i had ever seen in uh at least at the time in you know queer cinema had a lot to do with coming out and the coming out journey specifically and i didn't feel like it represented uh who i was now and you know the basically the journey of what a 20 something was um, in dating and how uh, dating felt in New York at that time. And so I, um, I also wasn't seeing, you know, roles for people. And so I just decided to write it. And uh, we actually just wrapped filming in March, uh, in April, sorry, in April. And uh, we're in post-production now. Uh, we have an amazing cast. It's myself, Joey Polari is the other lead. Um, we also have an incredible cast that Jackie Cruz is in it, Eric Roberts. We're really excited about, um, you know, bridging the gap of what a romantic comedy can be and can, uh, you know, represent everyone. Because I think that's what's exciting to us is that we are telling a story with um, two gay characters and uh, we want everyone to love this movie. We want everyone to feel represented. We want everyone to feel seen and, uh, you know, realize that uh love is a universal feeling falling in love is a universal feeling uh the fears of falling in love are universal the you know the anxiety of falling in love and all of that and uh letting yourself open up to someone i think that's the other part is uh i really wanted to highlight the anxiety of falling in love with someone and uh how scary it is to just be like you know what uh this is probably gonna end in a heartbreak either today or in 50 years, but it's gonna end at some point. And so I wanted to recognize that when we go into relationships, we we know that, um, but while also, you know, showing that love is beautiful and that uh, that's why we end up making that decision anyway. That's, that's amazing, so awesome. can't wait to see it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so it'll be out um, either later this year or early, uh, 2023 but I'm really looking forward to sharing it with everyone congratulations yeah, yeah. thank you yeah that's amazing that is no small thank you thing. yeah and I also wanted to shout out Terry who um no big deal is making Disney Channel history as the first non-binary lead in the upcoming movie Zombies 3 so congrats yes. to Terry that's thank huge. you so much congratulations thank you, thank you. But, thank you, know. you. <laughs> yeah. 
thank you so so much yeah um so what was the experience no, working yeah. on the film and and yeah uh on zombies three yeah um firstly i do want to shout out i think there was a um uh a non-binary um uh, cartoon character in disney last year um and i think you know I, this is live action so i do think it's mm. that but i want to you know uplift my community um yeah. but uh yeah i think um it was a really good experience honestly i was really grateful because I was kind of nervous. Like I came out last um, January of 2020 as non-binary and then I booked this April of 2021 and then I got there and I'm like, honestly, still working on correcting pronouns and stuff like that. Like I'm not super great at that, right? But the cast is just incredible and just really tight knit and like very much allied and stuff. But also honestly, like on production, you know, Disney really put everyone through like courses and stuff and just like educational like seminars and stuff and they connected me to a um a consultant from glad who like is such a mentor to me um and you know they were just really supportive and i think it was just something i couldn't have imagined but i'm so grateful to have had because just even the director like the director and the writers were really i think just like collaborative with me and wanting to hear like oh is this like good with you what are like do you have any input on the character and what i love kind of most of all is the character aspen is non-binary, but um, they weren't meant to be non-binary. They like a lot of my cast members, the new cast members went out for it as well and they're not non-binary. And so I don't think it was like, uh, because obviously I think sometimes in your cast you're like, am I being tokenized? Like that's just like in the back of the head sometimes. But mm -hmm. then I saw like, no, they didn't, like they didn't even plan for it, but they knew I was non-binary and they were just happy to, you know, like bring that in. And it, it seemed like kind of, kind of such, such like a casual thing. And I think mm -hmm. when I booked it too, I was like, you know, because on the day to day, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm at a job, like I'm working. But then these kids would reach out and be like, oh my God, like, oh my God. And you know, like, this is so big. And so sometimes I like fluctuate between realizing that it's monumental when personally on my day to day, I'm just like, oh, I'm just me. Like, you know, if that makes sense. So I think it's finding a right balance there. But mm -hmm. um, also to like, to that point, I, I just really believe that holistic representation like needs two types of stories, both. Like one is that, one is a type of story that, you know, more heavily revolved around the specific struggles that come with being a marginalized identity, right? Like, you know, really talk about that, but it's truly just as important to have stories that don't revolve around that, but just like include characters that yeah. are, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And sure, your struggles can be shown too and stuff like that, but I think it's so important to show that. And Zombies 3 is more of that second type of story. So I'm like, that's that was really cool to see that like, oh, they're not making it a meal, like, you know, but it just is, mm -hmm. it just is. And so, um, yeah. I, it, it was a really wonderful experience. I'm, I'm super excited. It's coming out July 15th on Disney Plus. <laughs> um, and, really yeah. cool to hear that they were so supportive and so awesome about your representation. That makes me yes. like really cool. Yes, they they honestly were. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and um, obviously with everything that's been going on, I think like I really respect and now I like I'm probably biased because I'm part of the Disney LGBT plus community, I suppose now. But like obviously with everything that happened, I totally get like you know, they're like everyone's point of view, but I do know that Disney like has been working on a lot of content that's like in the past couple of years that is very intentionally trying to like show significant LGBT plus representation. And it's like coming out finally. It takes a long time to make a movie like Max. It takes a long time. It's just like, yes. wow, but I'm, it really does. And so like, it's coming out this, like a lot of things are coming out and I'm like, just really excited for hopefully like the community to see it's like, like we, there is so much good coming, you know, and like, I know I feel the heartbreak with and for everyone too, when mm -hmm. things like happen, not the way that we want, but it is like, there is a lot good, com a lot of good coming. And I'm like kind of excited for everyone, to, like for those, you know, projects, like to get the love that they deserve, but also to give love to whoever needs it, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. And I, I'm really and grateful for the experience. To add to that point about the Disney, everything that happened with Disney yeah. in Florida, I mean, that's the people at the top making the decisions, you know, they're the ones taking the money from these anti LGBTQ, these hate campaigns and stuff. It's not these artists that you're working with and these directors right. and these individuals, right. you know what I'm saying? So I think, you know, as you know, within the community, we need to recognize that we don't want to chastise like the individuals that are working on a, you know, a singular level or to, with, you know, to get yeah. a movie done or a show done, you know, it's because they're yeah. not you know, corporate people at the top who are taking these donations yeah. and stuff. So yeah. I think that's really important, you know, because so on a, on a more micro level, there are things in Disney happening that are really bringing out representation. It's more like the macro, bigger, big wigs. Yes. 
you know, yeah. yes, yes. I think that there's just so much complexity to it, but I think what's important to focus on is like how wonderful the Disney's LGBT plus community is. And like also what is coming, you know, like there is a lot of good coming. Exactly. So let's like not take away from that, you know? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Like all y'all yeah. artists, like y'all are doing the work. It's not your fault yeah. that those are the top given they did, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're coming close to an hour already. So I don't want to keep you guys for too, too long. So uh, we're going to wrap up. Uh, with our last question, um, in 10 words or less, what advice would you give to a young actor? Ian, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you knew, like he's not gonna be able to do it in 10 words. Um, I was like... <laughs> uh, I think this was to my, like our youngest self, right? So you said? Um, just or, to uh, a young actor, any, any young oh, actor. To a, oh, to a young actor. Um, uh, like love who you are, your specialness, your high, your high voice, where you live in the world at that time that makes you feel like you're not going to be picked for, for the game or whatever is going to make you so special at some point in your life. And if you really want to be an actor, um, surround yourself with people who see the light in you and who light up when they see you. Um, and I think you'll, you'll feel some joy and love and support. And that's going to be the most, I think, helpful when you feel that sense of community at an early time in your life hmm. coming into the craziness that is Hollywood. I don't know if it's gonna be 10 words, I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but for, I'm in the music industry, so for musicians out there, for singers, songwriters, artists out there, um, I think um, be, be true to yourself and don't let other people's opinions affect your art and what you're trying to put out because there's a lot of voices in the music industry telling you what you're supposed to do and the best things that I've ever done have come from the deepest parts of myself without letting other people interfere so really listen to your personal voice as a lyricist as a musician as an artist and don't let people take that away from you I would say that I have like three oh sorry go ahead Troy it's okay sorry. do you want to go first <laughs> no I want you to go <laughs> um, I would say uh, that you need to come up with your own personal definition of success. I think comparing yourself to other people's careers is one of the most dangerous things that you could do. Yes. And um, yeah, and then trust your gut when it comes to who you want to work with, what you want to work on, and know that there's not one opportunity that's going to be your key to success. I feel like a lot of people think that success looks kind of like a slow incline. It looks more like a heart rate monitor where it's like nothing, 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 something, and then nothing, 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 nothing. Legitimately, that's it. Yeah, You're, it's not like, you know, it's like you could, you, could be, you could be on every publication feeling like you're at the top of the world and then six months later, a producer texts you asking if you're available for a catering gig, which literally just happened to me. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I love you. You're like, that just happened to me. No, you're right though. Cause you got to take the wins because the industry is a roller coaster. And I literally said this to my friend the other day. I'm either like so busy or I'm just like, there's nothing going on. You know, it's, it is like that. So yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah. Adding on to actually what Troy said, I think one of the most important things is uh, recognizing everything you've done as an accomplishment, right? Like, I mean, literally like when you write a page, that's an accomplishment. When you um, make it out the door to a meeting, that's an accomplishment. And then also, you know, you recognize the bigger stuff, right? Like, but I think every time you recognize that, then uh, the um, fear of I haven't done enough yet, kind of, it, 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 it doesn't go away. It'll always be there because that's life. And that's how we feel, you know, is that we always want to do more. Um, but I think the more that we recognize what we've already done, uh, it becomes easier to strive for more because, you know, you, you're already enjoying what you've done. Um, also, I, I will, trusting your instincts is one of the most important things in this industry. Troy said it for a sec. I think it's uh, trust who you work with, but also um, trust yourself in like the moments, you know, where you feel scared because you know yourself best better than anyone and so if you you know trust your gut and what you're feeling I think that's one of the most important things in um this industry you know Terry takes away. um yeah specifically I think towards the youth or young actors that maybe are demoralized from not seeing themselves on screen so they don't feel like maybe maybe I can't do this because I haven't seen it I haven't seen proof to prove me wrong 
I think um, keep going because your dreams are not an impossibility. Your dreams are not too big. Like I really think they can happen, you know? Awesome. Well, guys, thank everyone. Thank you so, so much for, for joining us on the show today. Um, mm -hmm. Conversations like these, I wish I could just be like a two hour conversation because there's just so <laughs> much more that I want to ask. Um, but you know, well, maybe we'll do a part two at some point. Who knows? Yeah, um, I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but for uh, anyone who wants to yeah, find you all on to social do. media, we just, we just explain that. <laughs> <laughs> just like, I don't want to do this catering job, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for anyone that wants to find you all on social media, uh, where can they find you? Troy, go ahead. Uh, at Mr. Troy Iwata, it's my name. And Lake? at Lake Official, it's L-A-Y-K-E Official anywhere on socials and at Lake, L-A-Y-K-E on all streaming services. Awesome, Terry? Um, at who is Terry, the who is H-U, it's my last name. Ian? That's, we, I love a play on words. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, on Insta, you can find me at Ian Paget, and then on TikTok, it's at Ian Paget underscore. Ian Max. Um, you can find me at the Max T Show on all socials. And you can follow us on Instagram at Actors with Issues. Give me a follow at Juan Yala Official and check out all of our full video interviews at youtube.com slash actors with issues podcast or listen on the go wherever you get your podcast every Monday. I'm Juan Yala. This is Act with Issues, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>